All right, seeing that it's 12.01, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for your patience as we worked out through the technical difficulties. Um, welcome to Socorro's webinar series, Coastal Observing in Your Community. Thank you so much for sharing your virtual lunch hour with us. My name is Abby Wakeley, Socorro's Communications Director, and I will be facilitating and moderating the webinar. Socorro is hosting this webinar series to discuss, highlight, and raise awareness about coastal ocean, ocean observing activities in the Southeast US and beyond. Socorro is the regional coastal ocean observing system for North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We are one of 11 that make up the NOAA-led U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, also known as IUS. Our mission is to sustain and promote observations that help keep you safe. This is a quick snapshot of the technology we support to accomplish our mission. I want to quickly highlight um, Socorro membership opportunities. Socorro is a nonprofit and membership dues allow us to invest in ocean observations, research and student opportunities. If you're interested in becoming a member and helping guide coastal observing in the southeast, please reach out to us. I also want to share we have webinar spots open for the fall. Do you have a project you would like to present on our webinar series? Please email me. All right, let's get to the reason you are all here the webinar. All participants are in listen only mode. You are encouraged to type questions for the presenter or technical questions for me in the bottom right chat or Q&A box. I will respond to them directly or post the questions to our presenters after their presentation. We are recording this webinar today and we'll be posting the recording on the Socorro website. We are very excited to welcome four speakers from the University of South Florida College of Marine Science. They will be presenting establishing baselines for benthic habitat and fish populations on the West Florida shelf via the power of combined visual and acoustic technologies. We have Dr. Steve Murawski. Dr. Steve Murawski is retired to USF after leaving NOAA in 2011, where he was chief scientist at the National Marine Fisheries Service. Upon arriving at USF's College of Marine Science, Dr. Murawski became heavily involved with research surrounding the deep water horizon oil spill but continued with fisheries related research via the development of the camera based assessment survey system or CBAS and most recently CSCAMP, which is what they will be discussing today. And then we have um, Chad Lemke. Chad completed his bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of South Florida and in 1998 joined the College of Marine Science Ocean Technology Group. He has since provided engineering support in many of in many projects at USF's College of Marine Science, which have used buoys, gliders, towed platforms, and more. And then we have Sarah Grazzi. Um, Sarah graduated from the University of South Florida College of Marine Science in 2012, and her master thesis dealt with investigating the use of camera-based assessment survey system or CBAS, as I had mentioned before as a survey tool for reef fishes. Sarah currently works as a research scientist for the SeaScamp project, where she will continue analyzing the sea bass video for reef fish related data. Lastly, we have Alex Illich. Alex is a PhD student at USF College of Marine Science studying marine resource assessment. Alex earned his master's degree from the college in October 2018, and his thesis focused on utilizing data from sea bass and multi-beam sonar to develop a semi-automated classification approach to habitat delineation. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then Sarah, I'm going to promote you to presenter so you can share your screen. So now you should have screen sharing capability. Sarah, are you there? Yep, I'm just trying to make it so that um, Chad can um, take on the uh, the first bit of this. Um, All right, we're I... not seeing your screen. Okay, do you want to try passing it again, um, uh, taking it back and passing it to me again? Absolutely. It's not working like it did last time, so. Okay, I am now the presenter. Oh, share, okay, share content. Got it. All right. So you can all see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So. I'm going to then pass off the keyboard and mouse control to Chad. So give me a second. Okay, Chad, it should be all you. Okay, looks good. 
And as, as Abby set us up, okay, so this is uh, Dr. Morawski, myself, Sarah, and Alex, and my job for this the introductory portion is to set them up so they can hit home runs um, uh, with, with the rest of the data and what we're doing, okay? So we have a big group. Um, you can see all the names there. I'm not going to go through them all. But uh, the order of events is going to be myself and then Sarah going through um, a, a little bit of discussing how we actually analyze the data. And then Alex is going to go through and go through a very specific uh, application of the data. And uh, one of the one of the better um, uh, products that we feel we've developed, and then Steve is going to bring it all uh, kind of back together again. Okay, but I, I do want to highlight, um, you know, this has all been funded by the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation, and we are very thankful for their support for this. So, what we're doing is establishing baselines for benthic habitat and fish populations on the West Florida shelf via the power of, of combined visual and acoustic technologies. Uh, oh, I just hit too many. Apologies. Okay, so what are we trying to do, right? Okay, so the scope of the problem is how can we help fisheries managers do a better job maybe of, of assessing fish populations, okay? So with that, we are looking at using habitat classification and the long-term goal is designing a sampling system to, to estimate absolute abundance of reef fish populations and habitats because we believe that, um, that fish live in neighborhoods, right? And so just like people live in neighborhoods. So what are we trying to do? So the very simplistic view is we all understand satellite imagery and and Google Earth is 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 the greatest. We all know that the the people live in these gray areas and bears and other deers and other things live in these green areas, okay? So how do we extrapolate that to this great blue yonder? We have developed this process. So we use a combination of multi-beam echo sounders to map the bottom. And then after we've mapped the bottom, we tow video over it with the sea bass system, which I'll get into in a second. And then simultaneously to towing video, we do uh, scientific fisheries echo sounders to, to try to ascertain water column biomass. And so the first order of analysis of this is looking at the bathymetry, creating maps to see what the bottom looks like. Then looking at backscatter, which is a combination, which is a strength of return of the acoustics to ascertain what the bottom might be composed of. And then when we tow the video over the top of it, we look at the habitat again and say, is this hard bottom? Is it soft bottom? Do Can we just tell based on the acoustics or, or is there more fine scale analysis that we can do? And at the same time, we're creating uh, environmental sensor, sensor data, such as CTDs and fluorometers and other optics. But then, you know, of course, the, the main portion of looking at uh, a towed video system is looking at the fish and turtles and other things that are, are, are in the water column or, or near the bottom. And lastly, we compare that to um, split beam fisheries echo sounders, which, which look at the acoustic biomass in the water column. And so based on all that, we can create habitat maps and, and um, to understand what the, the, the bottom looks like. But then uh, using the video and combining those, we, we can look at the fish 
relationships between uh, the various types of bottoms. And then lastly, we can combine all that together and get species level uh, analysis of, of, of the entire region. And the ultimate goal is to create species level habitat maps and stratified population estimates. And so then once we developed this process, it was is a process of where do we go look? Okay, so the West Florida Shelf is one of the most undersampled regions in the entire continental US, as you can see based on this NCEI uh, image. So we looked at that image and we saw there's a huge area of, of, of areas that are not uh, currently mapped or, or analyzed well. And we used uh, VMS data in combination with, this is some of uh, Marcy Cockrell's uh, dissertation, uh, looking at um, what are the hot spots of where the fish, uh, fisheries people, the, the fishermen uh, go and look. And so we have an area that, that we kind of highlighted and we decided to, to analyze the, the area between the Florida middle grounds and the steamboat lumps off of Tampa Bay. And so how do we do that? Very simply, multi-beam anthemetry, I think the vast majority of you guys understand, and includes um, mapping the bottom, mowing the lawn, you have to account for vessel motion, sound velocity, tide, nearly continuously all the time. And so then you, know, you go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and you get pretty images like this. You know, this is an area called the elbow off the coast of about 90 miles offshore of Tampa Bay. And um, you get, um, you can see the bathymetry straight up, but not only do we get that, but when you analyze the data, you can get a little bit more. You can see the, the, the actual um, up and down of, of, of what's happening. It's, an, it's not just a pretty picture. And Alex is gonna talk about that a lot later on. And so then after that, we go back and we tow video across it, okay? And so very simply on the right-hand side, you can see a ship towing a tow body behind the boat. That tow body is a pickup truck and it holds a lot of stuff. We include six video cameras, um, a bunch of environmental sensors, including a CTD and fluorometer and transmissometers for optical clarity issues. We also include a, a VR2 Vemco receiver, just in case we happen to get near anybody, any fish that have been tagged, we can hand that data off. Um, but all that data is collected at one to two hertz and, and assimilated into looking at that. At the same time, we're collecting the video data, we are collecting the uh, EK60 acoustic water column biomass data so that we can compare that. And Sarah is gonna talk quite a bit about that. You know, and so this is just a very quick image of, of it going in the water. You know, and then this is this is the very typical imagery that we see both from the uh, video cameras as well as from the uh, EK60 sonar. And so in summary, this and this isn't the, the, the full summary, but but just to kind of give you guys a, a picture of, of, of all this is that we have mapped over 2,300 square kilometers. We have over 2,500 kilometers of transect data that includes video from six cameras and CTV and other sensor data, as well as uh, water column sonar. Um, we've had over 172 days at sea total for, for this project over the last five years. Um, we've collected 320, 27 hours of, of video data and acoustic data for water column sonar. And we've, we've done a fair number of presentations and it's been a, a, a pretty big group that has done this. And so the last thing I'm gonna say before handing it off to Sarah is, this is a lot of data that we've collected and we have done what we were asked to do with the data, but that data should not sit on servers in 
in perpetuity. I mean, we have that data, we're willing to share it, we're willing to collaborate with people. Um, all that video data, all that echo sounder data, it, it, it's there to be used. So that, that's kind of part of the take home of this entire uh, discussion. And from here, I'm gonna hand it off to Sarah. Okay, perfect. Um, you, and I think you all can hear me. I think I heard myself echo for a second. Um, so I'll take control back. Um, okay, so thank you, Chad. And, and now you all have a good understanding of how um, we've set our project up. And uh, if you can't tell already, we're very exploration and, and data acquisition driven, um, have been for the last several years. And so, um, you know, what I'm, I'm going to get to talk to you about is more about our, our bread and butter, which is the seafloor mapping and the imaging for the purpose of benthic habitat maps and, and baseline fish information. But Seascamp is a lot more than that. We have a lot of sub projects. And so, um, and they're pretty far ranging anywhere from some sea turtle work, fisheries echo sounders, which you heard a little bit about already, um, sedimentology and geomorphology. Um, camera calibrations, um, some advanced uh, uh, software auto recognition work, and then um, I will highlight a little bit about our outreach efforts as well. So you've been forewarned, I'm about to throw a lot at you. I'm gonna transition quickly, but it's because I wanna make sure that we can get it out there about everything that we've done in case there's people that are out there um, who are interested in using the data or collaborating in the future. Okay, so first off, a little bit more about the multi-beam side of things. So I think a lot of us on the call are, are probably familiar with uh, multi-beam bathymetry. It shows us a lot of the seafloor features and gives us particularly um, depth information. Um, and I just also wanna mention before moving on, um, the uh, lead on this uh, part of Seascamp is Matt Homeyer, and he'll actually be um, available for questions at the end in case there are any posed on uh, this topic. So, um, uh, so we've got the bathymetry, but uh, we get another piece of information when we go out with our multi-beam echo sounders, and that's backscatter. And so, you know, not only the, are we measuring how long it takes the acoustic pings to come back to the receiver to get the, the depth, but it's also how strongly it gets reflected, which is what the backscatter is an indication of. And it's just, um, you know, kind of gives a better idea of what the seafloor is made up of, how, what the texture of it is, the fine scale texture. Um, and actually it can sometimes show you things that the bathymetry missed, like this pipeline here. Um, and if you can kind of see that a little better, it's virtually invisible, um, the bathymetry. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with backscatter, you'll know why, but we're not gonna get too much into it today. It can be a tricky piece of data to work with, especially when you go and uh, survey an area over multiple different cruises. So we're just gonna stick to the bathymetry. Um, and so some of what we can glean from this information includes um, ridges, slopes, and troughs, um, which you can very clearly see here on this rendering of the elbow, which as Chad mentioned is um, it's about 90 miles, almost directly west of Tampa Bay offshore. Um, it's a popular fishing spot and you can kind of see why there's that long ridge, main ridge that runs down the middle of it. And um, we can also see transient bed forms on our bathymetry, such as sand waves, which um, you can see some larger scale ones over here. Another uh, interesting habitat that we can detect on bathymetry is grouper holes. And I'll get into that in a few slides if you're just totally wondering what those are. Um, and what's great, uh, or what's been great, is that not only do we see these natural seafloor features, but we do also encounter some man-made things on the seafloor. Um, and specifically for us, that's been pipelines and shipwrecks, um, what we are just generally re referring to as uh, cultural resources. Um, and sometimes sea bass gets to join in on the fun and see some of them too. But um, this is just an example of a shipwreck that we came across called the MV Holstein, and we decided to really intensely map it, which resulted in this really neat imagery. It's probably, it. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of shipwrecks, but that's one of the most perfect shipwrecks I think I've ever seen. Everyone survived, luckily. Um, and it is, a, a, people do go there and fish, um, even uh, go diving on it. It's, it's deep, but it's, it's diveable. Um, another shipwreck that we came across is, um, it's this unknown one. It's not a named shipwreck, um, but it is known to the marine archaeology community. So it's not, um, you know, 
we didn't discover anything, unfortunately. Um, and what was great about this one was we did get to put eyes on it with the sea bass. And so you can see some imagery there, certainly man-made, and it created a really nice little artificial reef in the middle of a sandy desert. And it was it was chock full of amberjacks and there were some goliaths on it. So very neat stuff there. Um, the last, uh, or the next um, man-made structure that we very frequently um, survey are pipelines. Um, we've done some in the central and western Gulf, Gulf as part of another project, but um, for as far as the West Florida shelf goes, primary our work has been done on the Gulf Stream pipeline, which is what you're seeing in this image, this uh, Bathy image here, um, because that's the only piece of oil and gas infrastructure currently on the West Florida shelf. And so you can very clearly see the pipeline. Um, it's about three feet in diameter to give you some uh, scale reference. And that thing smack in the middle is actually a valve cover. And that's about six feet in height. And as I mentioned, um, we, we go over these frequently and also sea bass them all the time. It's, I think, our group, one of our group's favorite spots because it's always just chock full of fish, um, pretty diverse array of fish as well. And um, actually this bottom image down here is uh, the backside of that same valve cover that was in the bathymetry image. And um, it, depending on who's driving, it can be pretty stressful to go over that thing. And just lastly, just some more cool imagery to throw up. Um, we have seen a few super old looking anchors, um, just kind of neat when you come across those. Um, however, we have only seen one torpedo, which is on the right hand side. And um, we did send it to the Navy and they were very interested. As far as we know, it's still there. Okay, so switching gears a bit, um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but we um, did collect some seismic data, which is indicated by the white lines there in the map, as well as some um, sediment samples, which are those black pins. Um, this was really led uh, by Dr. Stan Locker, so please contact him if you're interested in more info. Um, and Steve will also touch a little bit more on it in his section of the presentation. But the point here is that um, we did it to supplement the multi-beam bathy and backscatter um, to, to better understand how hard bottom has formed on the West Florida shelf over the last you know, tens of thousands of years so that we can more effectively scout for new areas to map. And you know, the, the West Florida shelf is huge, so you don't wanna be shooting in the dark. Um, so that was the purpose of that part of C-SCAMP. Okay, and then moving on now um, to the sea bass side of things. So this is what our imagery looks like. I will concede this is some of the best visibility we ever got. Of course, I'm gonna show you guys, you know, the highlights, but um, this is in the elbow um, and that's our typical towing altitude about three to four meters high. So we get really great views of um, the, the benthic habitat as well as who's home. And um, as Chad mentioned, he, he gave you these stats, you know, we, we've collected just a lot of video over, you know, 300, and, uh, 300 hours of video, um, over 2,500 um, kilometers of transect. And when you uh, kind of, when you incorporate our field, typical field of view, that equates to imaging um, about 25 square kilometers of seafloor um, between 2016 and 2019 as part of this project. Um, during that time, we have seen 124 unique species, and most frequently we see lionfish, gray snappers, and um, big eyes. And, um, oh, I revealed it too quick, that's okay. Um, so as uh, you can kind of see from the map here, the Gulf Stream pipeline, which is um, runs right here, had our highest densities we observed. Um, however, low relief hard bottom, it, it does at least from what we've seen, and um, I'm sure others who do work such as, uh, you know, other fish survey work in the Gulf can attest to, low relief hard bottom is a, is a very important habitat. It's not all about the high relief structure. Um, all of this here is low relief, same goes for here. Um, this side of the elbow, and then both of these areas down here. There's nothing more than a three to four meter change at any point. So, um, and what challenge that presents is that this low relief hard bottom is super patchy, um, super dispersed. Um, so 
we really have a lot more work to do in terms of, of mapping and, and ground truthing to better understand the distribution of this uh, seemingly important fish habitat on the West Florida shelf. All right, so next up, I wanted to zoom into a, a small case study that um, that married both the multi beam side of things and the sea bass side of things. And that was in the Steamboat Lumps Marine Protected Area. And this work actually built off of a study that was done by Dr. Carrie Wall, um, who was a PhD student at the University of South Florida. She's now um, at NOAA and CEI. So she collected multi beam bathymetry of red grouper holes in this MPA in 2006 and 2009. Um, and so for those of you that don't know, uh, red grouper do create their own habitat. They excavate holes in the sand and um, they the underlying limestone structure does provide, uh, you know, if they excavate it enough, they've got these big red grouper holes um, for, you know, living, eating, spawning. Um, and so what we did is we went and collected more multi-beam of the same area in 2017 to look at trends in these red grouper holes. So there's um, some examples uh, of the bathymetry we collected and a zoomed in example of one of the holes. And so I replicated her methods and took various metrics of the holes. Um, some of them, you know, most of them, the same exact ones that Carrie had measured in, um, you know, 2009. And um, what we also did was towed the sea bass quite extensively uh, over this field of grouper holes to see who was home. And I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty, but um, generally we found that the hole density has continued to increase just as uh, Carrie found with her study, um, showing that this MPA could be having really strong positive effects on the local red grouper population. And as far as the sea bass observations go, um, Nine, or 84 percent of the 95 holes that we saw had at least one lionfish uh, living in there often most often more than one um so what ecological implications have that that has i'm not sure but cer certainly warrants um, more study because this is an important habitat for a really uh important uh species especially in florida in terms of you know seafood and all that so all right, so switching gears now over to some sea turtle work that we've done. Um, so not only do we see the fish uh, that we're looking for with sea bass, but we also fairly frequently encounter sea turtles. And um, in total, we've seen 79 uh, over the time that uh, Sea Scamp has been going on. And um, this work has been spearheaded by uh, Dr. Heather Broadbent. Her publication is, is down there in the bottom right for you all to take a look at if you're interested. But um, what we have found with sea bass is, is number one, that it could present a really powerful tool for in situ observations of offshore sea turtles. Um, those data are hard to come by. Um, I'm sure many of us know, you know, typically the studies are done on the large adult females because they come, you know, they nest on shore. So they're easy to tag and measure and all that good stuff. But um, you know, what we've shown is, is toad video can potentially be a really powerful tool for, for these um, observations offshore. Um, and what we've also seen is that, you know, despite recognizing that there may be a sighting bias um, between artificial habitat and natural habitat with our system, nonetheless, the Gulf Stream pipeline appears to be a really powerful uh, concentrator for sea turtles is what you're seeing up here. Um, and so that definitely has some implications for future study and possibly even uh, management considerations. Uh, the pipeline transects were only 17% of the total sea bass transects we did, yet it accounted for 89% of the sea turtle uh, sightings that we saw. Okay, and so getting now into pairing acoustics in terms of the, the fisheries echo sounder, so not the multi beam, but instead this is a Simrad um, EK60. Uh, echo sounder to insonify the actual fish biomass um, in an area and then pairing it with the the sea bass uh, fish data and this deserves a whole talk in and of itself um, unfortunately i only have one slide to devote to it but please um contact ed hughes who is the phd candidate um working on uh, this side of things for us as part of his uh, dissertation but what i wanted to touch on was the the really big reason for what why we're doing uh, this work is um, so you have the sea bass data here on the right 
does its thing. It, it's meant to be near the sea floor. You know, it's it's bottom tending. Um, so you get the sea floor information, and then you can see we've got a school of creole fish in this example. That's all well and good. Like I said, it does its it. So it comes in through here, and we saw what was down here. But what's what about that whole section of fish? So the idea here is just to increase um, our power in terms of uh, fish surveys if we can quantitatively, obviously, ideally, um, relate what the acoustics um, data says and what the fish data says. All right, and then um, moving into uh, another sub project that we have, which is with uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute's um, Fisheries Independent Monitoring Group. And my collaborators here are Dr. Ted Switzer and Sean Keenan. So you all know enough about the sea bass at this point, you have an idea of what it is and what it does. Um, and what FIM does for their fish surveys is use something called an SBREV. And so you can kind of see here with the comparison that they really couldn't be more different in how they survey um, reef fish uh, on the West Florida shelf. Really, we only are similar in that we can both measure fish um, and, I, and we use the same camera models or we did it at last I checked. And so what we're hoping to do here is again, just in, increase the power of um, reef fish sampling on the West Florida shelf, because if we can relate quantitative or relate the data from the SBRUVs with the data from sea bass, you know, you're, you're opening it up to having a lot more um, data available to inform various management uh, needs. Okay, and then uh, second to last, I just have two more aspects I wanted to highlight. So um, we have done some work with SRI International um, based out of Princeton, New Jersey as a subcontract. So what you're seeing here is our footage run through the software that they developed for us. And um, so the it's picking up background, which is, is fine. You know, we can ignore that when we um, get the output, the text file output. So that's those green uh, boxes. The fish are being detected with red boxes and then just like, you know, garbage stuff that it's detecting are the brown ones. And um, so what's we're really excited about this because um, we feel that there's really great app, uh, potential, you know, with this type of technology. Um, it could really increase uh, with all of the, you know, visual fish data being collected nowadays, moving away from traditional technologies of uh, nets and trawls and, and long line stuff. Um, there's going to be you need a lot of manpower to do that. And so if you could even just identify when there are pulses of fish within long feeds of video and cut out all the, the sand, because one can only look at so much sand, um, you know, it that would that would be huge. And um, particularly with our footage, you have extra difficulty with having a mobile platform, mobile organisms, and as you can see, often poor viz and uh, lighting. So we've been really um, happy with what we have uh, worked on with SRI so far. And it's uh, certainly something that's still in development and we want to continue. And lastly, before I hand it off to my colleague Alex, um, I just wanted to mention that we have done a lot of outreach near and dear to my heart. Um, and I want to thank our project technicians, Abigail Vivlemore and uh, Rachel Crabtree, as they have um, helped out immensely with all of this stuff. Um, so if you're interested, all of it is already on our website or will be uploaded soon. Um, so please check it out if you would like. And with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and let Alex take over and um, tell you more about the habitat. All right, so. It should I have control? Okay, yeah, you should have control. Let me just Perfect. mute myself first before you take it. Hold on. Uh, or wait, oh, I don't think, I, I don't know if I can. All right, I'll just be quiet, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about um, high resolution multi-beam and how we can use these data uh, for fisheries management applications and how we can actually look at this and interpret the substrate on the seafloor. Uh, so shown here is the uh, multi-beam bathymetry that's at high resolution, meaning at about 10 meter resolution or finer. 
This includes data we've collected as well as data collected by other groups such as USGS and individuals such as Dr. David Narr and Dr. Stan Locker at University of South Florida. Um, so first, a quick aside on what is habitat. Uh, the Coastal and Marine Ecological Classification Standard or CMEX is what NOAA uses and it's the national standard for describing marine habitats. Um, mainly in our video platform, the CBAS, we can see these two components, the substrate and biotic component, but to some degree, we can also observe the geoform component, which is the larger scale structures on the seafloor, uh, especially when we're combining it with the multi-beam. So some of the typical things we see uh, in our substrate is rock or sand substrate, and we divide the rock substrate among various different relief classes, which just indicate how high uh, the rock is elevated above the surrounding seafloor. And for the biotic component, we often see attached organisms such as sponges and corals on the seafloor. So the overall goal of this part of the project is to develop habitat maps and use those habitat maps to estimate the abundance of different important fish species uh, on the West Florida shelf. And we can get densities of fish over different habitat types simply by running the sea bass, identifying the habitat, and counting up the fish species we see over each habitat. And then the habitat map, we have to combine both the visual observations of habitat from the sea bass camera system with the multi-beam acoustic data. And to do that, we use a supervised classification process. So we start with that bathymetry layer that you've seen before. So this is kind of a cartoon just representing that bathymetry layer that shows the depth, as well as a corresponding backscatter layer that represents how strongly the sound actually returned to the sonar head. And that can be indicative of the substrate type or the grain size. From those two main data sets, we can then derive various features. So from the bathymetry, we can get terrain attributes that describe the shape of the seafloor. That can include things such as the slope or the seafloor roughness. And from the backscatter, we can derive these texture metrics that quantitatively measure the texture of the backscatter mosaic image. We can then plot in space the ground truth habitat images uh, with their corresponding classifications from the sea bass. And then we can fit a model. And specifically, I use a random forest model to learn what each of the habitat types looks like in terms of these various different layers I've described. Once we fit that model, we can then use it to predict out to the entire study area to get a single map where each pixel has been labeled with a habitat class. So in practice, what we have is multi-beam bathymetry for all these areas on the West Florida shelf. And I'm gonna focus in a bit on this area over here where we've collected quite a bit of ground truth data. This includes three different areas, the Florida middle grounds, um, which was previously collected multi-beam data, the Southwest Florida middle grounds, uh, which is just to the Southwest of the Florida middle grounds. And then in the bottom is the elbow. And what you're seeing here, uh, the background layer is the multi-beam bathymetry, and then the dots overlaying that are red and kind of a sandy color are the ground truth habitat images from various sea bass transects that we've run. Uh, we collect habitat observations uh, every 15 seconds from the video. I then use these observations to train a model, so I split 80% of the observations into a set that was used to train the model. And then I left 20% of the observations aside to test how well the model actually worked. So once we run the model, we get an interpreted map of substrate for these areas. And you might be wondering how accurate it is or how much you can trust it. And that is what the test set I mentioned is. So we check how well the observations match the predictions within that test set that wasn't used to fit the model. And we get an accuracy of about 96% and another 
measure of model performance that ranges from zero to one is the Kappa score. Uh, and we get a value of 0.74 and a general kind of rule of thumb is greater than 0.6 indicates substantial agreement. So overall, this model has done fairly well. You also might be wondering why use a statistical classifier. You certainly could go in and look at various acoustic layers and trace out the rocky reefs by hand, but it can be quite time consuming. If we zoom in here on the elbow and look at the bathymetry, there is this clear ridge, but there's also kind of these squiggles off to the side that might not have real clear boundaries. And the model will pick those up and delineate it for you. Uh, you might also notice the ridge is a little bit thicker than just that really dark high up portion in the bathymetry. Uh, additionally, using a statistical classifier is more objective. You know exactly what goes into it and how it was created. Whereas the way a human would trace it, there's a lot of decisions that go into that that you're not exactly sure of how it happened. And depending on who's doing it, you will get a different map. And then lastly, these maps can be iteratively improved over time. So if you collect more ground truth observations, or if you decide there's other variables that would be important to the model because you're not happy with the way it came out, you could simply just rerun the model, get new predictions and create an updated map. So now we're going to do a quick case study in the elbow showing how these maps can be used uh, in a fisheries management type context. So shown here is the substrate map from the elbow. And additionally, I've overlain vertical relief on top of it. And you can see, like Sarah said, a lot of the rock habitat is that low relief hard bottom. But if we zoom in, especially on that main ridge section, there are areas of a bit higher relief, but they take up a much smaller area. And we, I used three of the transects that we ran through this area in February 2016. And the reason why I divided it up into these three habitat categories is because we found that statistically, the fish communities differed among them. So if you look at the right side over here, you can see that the points that were in the sand tended to be differentiated by things like sand tile fish and more pelagic species like remoras and rainbow runners. We go up to the top left, you get that low relief hard bottom that has some of your smaller reef fish like squirrel fish, blue angel fish, and lionfish. And then moderate and high relief habitats didn't really significantly differ. Uh, and they had things like gray snapper, goliath grouper, and creole fish, which is another type of grouper. Um, and that helps describe some of the general trends that we see. But if we want to get hard numbers on how many fish are actually in this area, we can directly use the densities that we calculated for each taxa on the different habitat types. And then we can also count up all the pixels in the habitat map to get the area of each habitat type. And with those two data types, we can simply multiply them together and get estimates of the total abundance of different reef fish within that study area, both by habitat type and in total, if you sum across all those habitat types. And then lastly, I'd just like to close up with showing the map of the substrate that I showed earlier in the context of the whole West Florida shelf, and then point out that we have bathymetry for all these other areas, meaning we have the ingredients to predict out and get substrate. So we can get this map of about 11,000 square kilometers of classified substrate on the West Florida shelf, which can be useful for planning uh, surveys for fisheries independent monitoring of reef fish. It can be useful for doing similar analyses to the one I just showed before in the elbow. And it can be useful for designing future ground truthing efforts to validate and improve these maps in the future. Uh, and with that, uh, I guess, Sarah, pass it off to Steve. All right, give me one second, Steve. I'm going to assign you as the control. Okay. 
Okay, let me mute myself and then you should be good to go, Steve. Okay, I think I've got it. Um, thanks very much. Uh, certainly thanks to Chad, to Sarah, and to Alex for explaining a lot of the details. As, uh, as you can all see, this is a, a huge technological challenge to marry all of these different technologies together. Uh, and then also it's a huge uh, data analytics chore. Um, Alex described um, the process of creating a statistical model whereby we can take the bathymetry, which we can, we can uh, model on, as, as Chad said, o over wide expanses and marry that with the video. And even though we've done, you know, thousands of kilometers of video, it adds up to about 1% um, of the uh, square acreage that uh, we were able to, um, to image with the bathymetry. And so um, the notion that we can get a reliable statistical model to predict um, what these habitat types are and also the relative density of uh, absolute density of animals within them, um, that represents the data integration step that's so important in terms of turning bathymetry into something really useful in terms of a product that the end users can, can, can um, integrate into their management decisions. And as we know, Groups like uh, NOAA and NIMPS and, and uh, the states uh, are very interested in classifying essential habitats for, for managed fish species, for protected species, et cetera, and also um, interested in, you know, what are the, what's the absolute biomass of different species? And so I think um, w this is a, a demonstration project of, of how we're capable of doing that. And, uh, and, and certainly it's something that um, we've spent a lot of time and, and effort uh, number one, putting the pieces together. Uh, at the height of this particular project, we had 14 different people working on it, each bringing different um, types of disciplines to the to the picnic here. Uh, and so it, it, it requires um, quite a bit of technical expertise on the part of the people. Uh, and so that was actually one of the difficulties we had in assembling this project. Uh, we've been at this for about four and a half years. The initial project was funded uh, by a grant from NIMS to um, develop the CBAS camera system. And then we were able to get a larger grant from NIFWIF, um, which is part of the settlement money from Deepwater, to actually marry the technologies together. And so, so that's where we are right now. So we wanted to just focus a few minutes on some next steps that we see in, in Gulf of Mexico habitat mapping, and particularly on the west uh, eastern side of the Gulf where visibility is amenable to this kind of work. Um, we think that we need to extend the high resolution mapping in the eastern Gulf to about 15,000 square kilometers uh, of additional important offshore uh, reef fish uh, and turtle habitat. Now, uh, as Alex said, we, you know, the total amount of uh, habitat imaged right now is about 11,000 square kilometers, which is, you know, uh, relative to the 200,000 square kilometers, it's a pretty small number. On the other hand, we also know that about 80% of that is sand. Now, the sand, you know, it retains uh, quite a few fish and, and the extrapolations that Chet, uh, that uh, Alex showed uh, accounted for that. But if we want to really know where these high, um, high, um, highly important targets are, we, you know, we need to uh, image more of the area. So where does this 15,000 kilometers actually come from? So one of the things that we've been able to do, um, if I can get this thing to advance. Yeah. Um, is, uh, as as uh, Sarah talked about before, we've done some seismic imaging around some of these features. Um, and this is um, uh, a uh, instrument called bubble gun, which is a, a very low power seismic instrument that can actually uh, get down to around 20 meters below the surf uh, water uh, substrate interface. And so this, this um, uh, graphic you see here is ac across the, uh, the long axis of the elbow. And so you see um, the prominent uh, peak that uh, uh, Alex talked about. Uh, and then when you interpret the ge geology of this, that's really interesting. So you see that you have this um, larger um, uh, uh, bed form um, that's outlined in yellow, which is basically the, the superficial sediments. But you also see this red area, which is uh, lithified sediments. And it's really interesting because down in this area, it's primarily uh, carbonate uh, sand as opposed to quartz sand up farther north. And so even uh, and, uh, in terms of the geological history of this area, uh, 12,000 years ago, this was basically 
um, a sea level stand, right? So this is a drowned sea level stand, and even within about 10,000 years, you can get carbonate to actually lithify. So this is this is a stony progression. So what these um, what these uh, um, long um, uh, parallel surfaces are are a series of sea level stands that have been drowned over a period of time. So that gives us some clues uh, in terms of where we might look for additional areas that are similar to these. So if you look at um, the uh, the West Florida Shelf, you see these um, you see a bunch of transgressions in the low resolution bathymetry. These these sort of cul-de-sacs all along the West Florida Shelf, and we think they're very similar to the elbow, for example. And so these represent high um, value targets in terms of additional work. Um, there are a variety of features along the bathymetry here that we feel that um, really are going to be important in terms of trying to do this, and they include. Um, the continuous linear uh, paleo shoreline ridges, which are outlined in blue here. There are isolated um, barrier islands and, and, and ridge systems like Pulley Ridge, which is down south of the, of the image here. And then these uh, isolated spits, um, very much like uh, uh, a current day uh, uh, passenger roll, uh, you know, off Tampa Bay. Um, yeah, certainly, um, you know, these are bar more barrier islands. So we feel that, you know, um, using um, uh, the priorities that we've established from this um, particular project, that th uh, the next places we should look are these. Now, in terms of um, uh, the other things that we think we ought to do, we need to more fully develop the fl uh, a flexible autoclassification package, both for species and for habitat features. Um, as Sarah said, um, we've been able to, uh, with the help of SRI International, uh, develop um, this system which um, is actually the nice thing about it, as as Alex said, it can reproduce things quite well, and so um, it's not subject uh, necessarily to uh, differences in training, et cetera. And this is a problem of taxonomy, um, you know, throughout our our domain. Uh, but we also think that we can uh, classify the habitats within the CMEX criteria. So, for example, if you see uh, attached sponges, you know that there's a rock habitat underneath it, and it's not just sand. And so we think that it has a lot of potential to do those kinds of things. Um, the third thing that we, um, we certainly want to do um, uh, as part of this project and moving forward is archive the data uh, for efficient discovery. And our partner at NCEI has been really helpful. FWRI also has a, um, um, a, uh, um, a GIS capability where we're trying to put this. We think the oozes, um, like Sakura, um, have uh, a lot of potential. And we also know that um, we've been approached by a number of uh, commercial applications for these kinds of, of data. Uh, for example, the company StrikeLine, which uh, produces fishing maps. Garmin is very interested in these things. Uh, the company Seymour, which also um, produces fishing maps. And so, so the, the worst sin that anyone can do here is remap an area because they couldn't find the bathymetry that somebody might have. And so we need to make sure that as a community, we put these, pla uh, these data in, in places where people can discover them efficiently. Next, we need to engage in uh, further analyses of these data. As, as Chad said, we spent a lot of our time and effort collecting these data, but there's really interesting issues like species habitat associations, um, the fractal geometry of species distributions, um, a variety of things like cross calibration studies between the ongoing NIMPS and FWRI camera based um, systems for indexing refish. So there's, there's quite a few other studies that we could do. Um, next, um, uh, we think that, you know, based on what we've been able to find, we are going to try to further engage the regulatory agencies in prioritizing and protecting these valuable habitats. Uh, so, for example, we have a, a meeting scheduled with the Scientific and Statistical Committee of the uh, Gulf uh, Council uh, in September, where we're going to uh, basically show what we've got in terms of these habitats and and um, see how much they're interested in whether or not this is important for defining critical habitats, um, whether or not um, there's an opportunity to help define um, better the habitat areas of particular concern and other other issues related to protecting valuable habitats. Um, and one of the things I wanted to emphasize was it's not just the fishery management and uh, protected species management issues that we have. Uh, as, as many of us know, um, the Gulf of Mexico is a highly productive oil and gas producing region. 
And the oil and gas production in the Gulf is moving steadily east. So the graphic on the left shows you the currently producing uh, oil wells. Um, you can see that the, the far west has pretty much been abandoned, uh, but also the current leases that are held. And many of the new leases that are being bought by the companies are way to the east. Uh, and in fact, if you look at where the moratorium line is, um, they occur right up uh, in the area where um, it, they're basically up against the edge of the moratorium area. The industry is chasing a, a, a very productive play called Norflet, and that Norflet play goes down across the Florida escarpment. So the moratorium area is in place until 2022, and, and BOEM has already indicated that they're going to go ahead with a sale unless there's a, a political solution to it. If that's the case, then we have to be prepared to understand what habitats are out here that need to be taken off the table. Uh, but with uh, such a poor amount of this area actually mapped, it leaves us in a very poor position to say, look, no, no, you, um, these are their hard bottom habitats along the inner shelf, along the escarpment, et cetera. So there's some expediency here in terms of actually trying to, to um, better map this area because we know that eventually this industry will get over here one way or the other. Whether or not you know, there, uh, there is a permanent moratorium, I mean, it's out of our hands, but, but certainly um, we need to be prepared, and that means we need to better understand these habitats. So with that, um, I, I certainly think that um, we need to, um, beyond a particular project like ours, we need to create an enduring community of practice, and, and certainly for mapping efforts, we need a stable um, uh, base for, for doing these things. That is, you know, where does the funding come from? It's expensive to do. The cool thing is once you do it, you've got it, um, and so you can accumulate these maps over time. So, so again, I think also this is quite timely. So lastly, uh, I'd just like to thank um, the Socorro folks and, and certainly Deborah Hernandez and, and Abby for allowing us to do this. Um, have a great group of people here, and, and uh, it's been a lot of fun working on this project. And lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors and, and uh, collaborators, including the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, and then um, the Florida Institute of Oceanography and NOAA. So with that, we'd love to take your questions. Great. Thank you guys so much for the wonderful presentation. Anybody has any questions, please type them in the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll post the presenter. We are going to run about 10 minutes over to 1.10 because we have about five questions that have come in already. Um, the first question is, is the FISH recognition software proprietary or open source? Uh, I'll go ahead, Steve. So yeah, um, so I, actually I think uh, Jeff Short is on uh, uh, from SRI. Our intent is to make this open source. I mean, um, there's nothing, you know, I mean, obviously um, this was paid for by uh, primarily the, uh, the, the penalty number uh, money, and we've been able to um, get basically a runtime version of this, and so there's no reason why we can't um, make this uh, generally available, and so that would be our intent. Great, thank you. Did the fish density slash richness inform the Bethnic habitat categorization or were they independent? Yeah, so I can speak to that a bit. Um, so we do classify kind of various different attributes of habitat. So we kind of parsed it down to what we thought would be important. So things like substrate and relief, as well as whether or not there were attached fauna uh, we ended up knocking out using the attached fauna just because it largely followed the distribution of the rock. There was almost never any sort of bare rock. Um, and then I showed that the densities significantly differed among all of the habitat types, except for between the moderate and high relief, which is then why I merged together the moderate and high relief in the extrapolations. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, can you work backwards from fish abundance to define habitat? That's a really good question. You know, the question is, uh, is it a chicken or an egg, right? You know, um, and actually, that was the underlying uh, reason why we we asked Marcy to um, do this plot of uh, the VMS data. 
And that is, we figured, you know, if you're going to, uh, if you're catching groupers and snappers, then they must be over habitats that support them, right? And so, so that was the original um, way that we tried to, you know, generate a treasure map, right, to, uh, to actually do this. So uh, I do think, that, you know, that, and that's actually the point of the supervised classification, is that there are associations between these features that allow us to do that. So the question would be, uh, you know, how precise um, geographically can you get the fish data in order to actually extrapolate that? And so that, that becomes a really interesting problem. Great, yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Uh, also speaking to that, um, Chad, do you want to tell about the glider that you ran that you heard some acoustic noise? So, yeah. Completely ancillary to this is that we um, used uh, in, in a completely separate project, um, used glider data that recorded passive acoustic recordings of fish as well as uh, echo sound or biomass of data. And we're able to identify an area that was outside of our realm of interest in the Seascamp camp project. And we went back and found that there was actually like a two meter ridge and a bunch of grouper holes in that area based purely on that data. And so I think the point is absolutely positively, if you can streamline the acoustic biomass data, which is a really difficult um, data set to process, um, if you can streamline that, you can find these kinds of, of kind of hot spots of where things might be interesting, you know, but I think even beyond that, um, using um, just, just general mapping of, of while you're, while the boats are going in and out, finding those, those ways to use those data sets is, is uh, a challenge. But I think it does have a, a great kind of uh, opportunity to 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 highlight areas of interest. And I know there's a lot of citizen science going on in that direction. Um, but um, and I know uh, University of New Hampshire is doing a lot of that stuff. Um, but you know, I, I, I think a lot of our data sets could be mined in those di directions. If that makes sense. Great, thanks. Uh, we have another question. How frequently do you come across ghost fishing gear in your video transects? Um, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we actually, that's kind of, um, one of the next steps that we are hoping to do is actually anal go back through all of our footage and reanalyze for debris. Um, and uh, unfortunately it's, uh, it's not super uncommon, um, especially on the pipeline. We see a lot of um, hung up uh, nets and um, even so it, we didn't really talk about Madison Swanson much, but it's a, a marine protected area offshore of uh, Panama City up in the Panhandle area. And even though it is totally restricted to everything except uh, surface trolling at certain times of the year, there's a lot of line down there. Um, some other odd that we've seen, like, um, we even found like a plastic chair once, like sitting perfectly in the sand. Um, we've seen solo cups. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not terribly uncommon and it is, uh, something that we are hoping to go back through and analyze our data for. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Another question, as so many turtles were found on the pipeline, what type of activity were they doing that might attract them to the pipeline? Um, yeah, so uh, that's a uh, um, good question and another uh, highlights another great uh, aspect of using the sea bass is that we can, so I didn't get to talk about it too much, but with the sea bass, not only can we count and uh, ideally identify um, the, the sea turtle species, but we also get their behavior um, and then we can measure them, do all that good stuff, um, sex them if possible. Um, but most of them were tucked under the pipeline resting. Um, and so it appears that it's just a really convenient place for them to kind of wedge themselves under and, and hang out for a little while. Just to follow up on that, um, one of the things that we found was that most of the turtles we actually were able to image are neonates, right? And so 
That's very different than, you know, uh, sampling the turtles on the beach, which are primarily the nesting females. And so this gives us a, a much different look at, you know, part of the, the population age and size structure, um, you know, for turtles. And so, it, you know, it also gives us an opportunity to sample them if there's some particular biological reason to do so. Um, it, they're very easy to pinpoint along that, along that pipeline. The interesting question I thought we might get was whether or not um, we ought to define the pipeline as critical habitat given the, the population density of turtles on there. There, Steve. I, I, that is, that is, <laughs> it's kind of tongue in cheek. <laughs> well, we do have a fisheries management question. Uh, from a quick look, it looks like total fish abundance was higher on sand. Thus, there are actually more fish, including reef fish, located on sand habitat. What do you make of this from a fisheries management perspective? Well, let me let me try that, Alex. Um, so the point is, um, about eighty percent of the habitat that we we uh, were able to 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 multibeam was sand, right? So even at low population densities, the fact that you multiply it by such a big uh, area means that, and this is exactly the point that that uh, Chad made early on, that even though you know we are often attracted to the places that are highest densities, you know, sort of like. Times Square, you know, you can you, you see a lot of people, right? You have to account for the low density, high um, high volume areas as well, and so you can't just focus on the on the um, the high density habitats. You really need to take everything into account. Yeah, that's a, a, exactly right. Um, the densities are a lot higher on the rock, but the sand just has a much larger area. Um, though it is worth noting that here the rock is split up into two classes. I believe if you sum it together, it will still be a bit higher than sand, but also this is a target area that we know has a major ridge feature. So it will have more rock than likely a random patch on the West Florida shelf. Great, thanks. Uh, one more question. How can you discriminate between buried hog barn Buried hard bottom, that's hard to say, exposed hard bottom and exposed hard bottom using backscatter. Um, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't directly interpret the backscatter images. Uh, personally, what we do is, or what I do is we look at the images and the way that we differentiate is usually if there's some type of buried hard bottom, it'll look like sand, but there will also be attached things such as sponges and corals coming up. If the sediment is thick enough to prevent those things from sticking or they just happen to be there, we'll label it as sand and there's not really a way for us to know unless we were to directly interpret the backscatter image. Um, but maybe one of our geologists could speak to directly looking at the data. Hey, Alex, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit there. This is Matt. Um, backscatter, at least uh, the frequencies that we're operating at, uh, I think somewhere between 99 and 100% of our data was collected at about 400 kilohertz. And that's gonna give you at best just a few centimeters of penetration below the sediment water interface. Um, so all but your thinnest of sediment drapes over a hard substrate like that are going to be almost invisible, even looking at backscatter data. Um, in, a, in a few cases, yes, you can differentiate, um, like I say, a, a very thin sediment drape over hard substrate. You'll be able to recognize that in backscatter versus something that's uh, completely sand down to a little, uh, little bit thicker depth. But um, yeah, it is it is a challenge looking at backscatter, uh, particularly when you account for um, you know the fact that we've incorporated all these legacy data sets that were surveyed using different instruments, operating at uh, different frequencies on different vessels in different oceanographic conditions. I think the point is that it's um, it's a very relative measure. I think at this stage in its technological life cycle, um, so, but going forward. It's a, it's a real um, development area to, to better normalize these uh, data sets across time and space. 
Great. Thanks, Matt and Alex. And seeing that it's 110, um, we have had two more questions come in. So we'll answer these last two. And then um, if you all have any more questions, you can email me or the speakers and get those answered. So the second to last question, is there a plan to set up monitoring regimes to examine trends for some of these new hotspots or habitat areas of particular concern types for changes in fish community structure? For example, lionfish predation impacts. Well, l let me let me uh, let me try this one. Um, one of the things that um, you know, th this is a this is not a long-term monitoring program, right? This is a mapping uh, program where we we did a proof of concept, and and we have about six more months on this one. But one of the things that we did and we've done periodically is to go back and monitor some of these places, you know, along the same transects. And so, for example, um, we, we have a few transects through the, um, the middle grounds that we've, we've actually been able to occupy on several different occasions. And um, we saw a big drop in, in, in fish biomass after the big fish kill that we had a few years ago. And, and actually, you know, it doesn't seem like the density has improved that much. Uh, we haven't been there that frequently. But, you know, we, we also have done a periodic um, trans, transect monitoring out on the uh, elbow and then uh, certainly on the, on the pipeline. And so that, you know, by retracing those steps, you certainly set up uh, a, a pretty nice, uh, you know, uh, relatively site-specific monitoring program that you can do for things like this. And so, I, you know, uh, extrapolating this kind of uh, procedure to those kinds of um, long-term monitoring things is quite feasible. And this is where the importance of things like the auto recognition become, because when you put together a, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a long-term system to do this, you want to process the data quickly. And so I do think that, uh, you know, getting away from the sort of experimental things and, and getting onto an operational uh, reassessment program is something that certainly, you know, is it within the cards of doing. Yeah, and I just wanted to quickly elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so as Steve mentioned, we do have some repeated transects uh, through the Florida Middle Grounds, specifically one that goes east-west right through the middle of it. Um, and then we have a few along the ridge feature in the elbow. And so um, Ed Hughes, who is our uh, uh, fisheries acoustics uh, guru for the project, um, so he and I are working on uh, some of those data uh, in hopes to turn it into a publication. So we are currently working on it. Again, it's just we have only so many people, unfortunately, and, and so much data. So any any kind of collaboration, just please reach out. And I, I don't know if you can still see my screen. I think so. But um, the general email, if you want to contact the project, is cscampdata at usf.edu. Great. Thanks, Aaron. We can see your screen. Perfect. And then there's another question. Are there examples of gas slash oil corporations demonstrating sustainable practices? Moreover, are there any sort of collaborations with groups such as Seascamp, which elucidate vulnerable habitats and indirectly highlight potential mining sites? Well, there's a, there's a lot wrapped up in that question. Certainly, you know, <laughs> there's this issue of uh, seabed uh, mining. Uh, which is primarily going to be a deep sea issue. Um, uh, there are there is interest in the, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico. More interest out in the Pacific. Um, uh, a lot of people have talked about using uh, technology similar to ours to um, do uh, pre-assessments and, and and post assessments, those kinds of things. Um, there are a few examples of the oil companies working together with uh, with folks. Um, one of the best examples is. A few years ago, Bohm had a project where, uh, remember, when, when the oil industry is out there, they do a lot of seismic work, right? And that's deep se seismic work. That's with air guns. Um, but they also get the shallow water seismic information, which they're not particularly interested in. So um, Bohm was able to actually get some of the uh, oil companies to collaborate and, and strip off the, uh, the bathymetry, you know, the top meter or so of sediment, et cetera, and, and pull those data into a data set. And so actually we have a pretty good map of the deep sea of the Gulf of Mexico. The irony is um, up on the shelves or the approaches to the shelves are where that map tails off. And so we have this 
this gap where, you know, up on the shelves and then down to the escarpment, it's very poorly represented. But the oil company, is, you know, they're quite interested in mapping information, and they have collaborated. Great, thanks. Oh my gosh, we have one more question. Do you guys have time to answer the last one? We're here for you. Sure. Yeah. Sure. All right. Are there opportunities slash interests to map shallower regions of the West Florida shelf, the 20 to 40 meter range? Uh, you know, there there is a program called the, the Florida um, um, uh, map, Coastal Mapping Pro Program, which is um, people can go online and, and find that uh, URL. Um, the idea there is to try to see how much of this can be mapped with um, satellites, with LIDAR, uh, and then, you know, the most expensive thing is obviously going to be mapping with a ship. Uh, but also, um, NOAA has put some money into, you know, mapping some of the, the shallower areas. Um, and so um, there's a lot of opportunity for technological advancement in terms of uh, uh, autonomous vehicles and other things. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you contact us, we can kind of put people into, uh, you know, uh, contact with, you know, some of these programs that have done, for example, um, mapping with LIDAR, right, uh, which is a, a useful laser technique for very shallow waters like what we're talking about. Great. Thank you all. So that was the last of the questions. Thanks for everybody for tuning in and um, asking questions. That was a great little session. And thank you all, the team from USF CMS, for presenting this wonderful webinar. As Chad mentioned earlier, there's a lot of data. So if you guys are interested in the data, please reach out to um, the email that Sarah provided. I believe it's Sarah, can you repeat that email? <laughs> yeah, so it's just uh, cscampdata at usf.edu. Perfect. And um, we'll be sure to include that with the recording of the webinar. Thank you guys for tuning in, and thank you to the CSCAMP team for such a great presentation. And you're getting a lot of kudos. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Thanks, Abby. For thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.